So in the previous videos, we built a toy problem to demonstrate some of the implementations of floating point numbers in computers. A little 8-bit problem that shows you how you can take a number and pull it apart into its sign, its exponent, and its significant, and then use them to add and subtract or multiply numbers together, and some of the limitations of those formats. Now we're going to see what the representations look like in the real world, in the 32-bit float and the 64-bit double precision floating point number what their ranges are, what their limitations are, and how they all work. So the short or regular floating point number looks like this. It is a sign. It's eight bits for the biased exponent, which means uh, the middle of uh, two to the eight is about two to the seven is about 127. And so we subtract 127, which is the bias, um, from that number. And so we get an exponent range of uh, e, uh, two to the negative 126 to two to the positive 127. Then the uh, significant is 23 bits plus one bit because it's normalized. We get that extra bit when we normalize. So it's 24 bits of precision, except in denormalized where it's only 23 bits of precision. The double precision one is 11 bits of exponent, uh, which means two to the 1,000, uh, two to the, uh, yeah, two to the 1023, negative 1022 to 1023. And then 52 bits plus the normalization bit so 53 bits of, of, uh, of information for the fractional part uh, in the double, double precision. So that's great. Lots of information, lots of detail. We can represent almost any number that way. Um, but they're big and they're complicated, right? And so not forgetting that a double precision takes up twice as much space as a single precision. Here are the ranges, and we talked about this a little bit already in the video on MIPS implementations of floating point. When we do ARM, we'll show ARM implementation of floating point in the same way. Uh, but here are the sort of limitations. So the single precision or short floating point number is a 32-bit number with 23 bits of significant plus 1 and a significant range of 1 to 2 to the 2, 2 minus 2 to the minus 23. And we, if you're confused about why that's the range, go look at the toy problem. Um, we showed why that's a reasonable way to calculate the smallest and largest significance. Eight bits in the exponent. The bias is 127, which means we take the number that's encoded, we subtract 127, and that's the exponent that we actually want. Zero numbers. Uh, we, ex we encode in exactly the same way as with the toy problem. The exponent is 0 and the floating point uh, is 0. We d have denormal numbers and the exponent is minus 126. Again, we're not using minus 127 for that exponent for the same reason as in the toy problem. If you're confused about that, go look at the denormalized video on the 8-bit toy problem. Then our infinity is represented as exponent of 255. Not a number is represented as an exponent of 255 with the fractional part being not zero. Ordinary numbers now go in these ranges. And so the smallest number is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 38. And the biggest number is 3.4 times 10 to the positive 38. So exponents of bigger than 38 need double precision numbers. But mostly single precision numbers do pretty good. Double precision numbers, 64 bits. Same basic details everywhere. The bias is now, um, where's the bias here? The bias is 1023. So whatever 11-bit number is in the exponent, you subtract 1023, and that gives you the actual exponent that you're representing. And the range is the other important thing. 10 to the minus 308, 10 to the positive 308. Those 308 exponent numbers are really important to keep in mind because if you have exponents that are getting close to 300, you might worry about whether or not you can actually represent that number in a double precision or need some other format. And the other thing you can see sometimes is on calculators, if you get an exponent bigger than 300, um, you find that that's when the calculator starts to throw errors, right? Errors in the form of infinity or not a number that are represented to the user as just like ERR on the calculator. So that's the full range of these things. Now, if you want to actually calculate uh, to uh, calculate some operation with a floating point number, I'm going to walk you through the complicated details of exactly how that works. And it's a big mess. So when you are adding or subtracting two numbers, first thing is you have to make sure they're aligned, right? The powers have to be the same. So if you have two numbers, one is 1 point something times 2 to the 5, one is 1 point something times 2 to the 1, what you want to do, first step, is to figure out which one you're going to shift. 
Well, the chances are good that the bigger exponent is going to be the one that is closest to the final range of the answer because the smaller exponent is a smaller number. So you're going to have to compare those two numbers and figure out which one has a smaller exponent and then shift that one so that the exponents are the same. See? Shift that one so the exponents are the same. This is no longer normalized. This doesn't fit in the representation, but that's okay. Then you can add these two significands, and then you can put the result back into the representation as long as we haven't gone up or down by one power, which is entirely possible, right? If we carry, if we do these additions and we carry, 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 we might get to the point where this is now 2 to the 6 instead of 2 to the 5. The other thing we're going to have to do is round off whatever result doesn't fit in the representation, right? If we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 bits of, of, um, of accuracy in this example, we may find out that the result we have doesn't fit. What do we do? Do we just throw those numbers away? No. Well, there's actually a fairly complicated process of taking a few of the last bits and using them to decide how to represent the rounded value in the number, because we don't want to round in base 2, we want to round in base 10, because that's the numbers we're used to, right? Rounding in base 10 means figuring out if it's 5 or bigger, then it goes up, and if it's 4 or smaller, it goes down. And then some applications need to, to truncate, right? Need to go to the floor or to the ceiling, right? Lots of different cases when we're actually figuring out what value fits in that representation. So, let me show you now, and you're going to love this, the full hardware for adding and subtracting two numbers. Here's the whole process. Come back and look at this process if you want. Again, we're going to unpack. We're going to check the signs in the operation to see what we're actually doing. Then we're going to add the one from the normalized representations. We're going to check the exponents, figure out which one we have to shift by how much. We're going to add or subtract the aligned significance, right? We're going to do the actual operation. We're going to normalize and realign and then repack the result, put it back in. And this is what the hardware looks like. It is a beast, right? You think about adding two integers, this is all you need. It's just an adder, right? Because you know that the place values are the same. But now we have the situation where we don't know if the place values are the same. So first thing we have to do is we take these two numbers. Now I'm going to run through it with this example. 0.8125 plus 12.25 gives us 13.0625. And the example in binary is 0.1100 plus 1100.0100 gives you that result. Each of these numbers is represented in the normalized numbers. This is 1.0 times 2 to, the, 2 to the negative 1. This is 1.1 times 2 to the positive 3. These are the numbers that we get. So here is the full process. Watch this. So we get these 32-bit numbers, right? First step is to unpack them, to take those three fields and break them apart and align them into the places they need to go, right? So we take the signs and put them here, and we take the operation, which in this case is add, and we put it here, and then the logic decides what we actually do. We're going to take the exponents and put them here, and you can verify for yourself that these are the correct exponents. We're going to do two things. We're going to first subtract them to decide which one is more likely to be the correct end result, and then we're going to multiplex them to decide which one we're going to use. So we subtract the two together. That lets us choose one of them for the final result. Then we're going to take the difference and use that to shift one or the other so that the numbers are lined up in their place values. Right? <clears throat> we may have to swap them. We may have to flip one. If we're adding two numbers and one of them is a negative, right? we may have to flip that. So adding and subtracting, this is all very complicated as well. We're going to tack on these implied ones, right, for the normalization process. Then we take that difference. We use that to align the significance. Well, first, we take that difference, and we use that to choose which of the exponents, the bigger one, is going to be our final result. And then we use the difference to shift the result from the smaller exponent so that the place values are lined up, right? Then, then we can add. We add those two together, we get the result. We take off that leading one to normalize it. We have to also check and see if we carried over by one bit, so we have to shift this exponent by one bit. Then we can repack. Put everything back together, and we get our final output. This is the hardware for floating point numbers. Don't you wish you were never using floating point numbers? Whenever you use a floating point number in your programming, this is what has to happen. Adding two integers is one cycle. 
right? Adding two floating point numbers is multiple cycles, a very complicated and difficult process. Now it's optimized because this is what a lot of math is, is floating point. But if you can get away with doing integers, you should get away with doing integers. Final thought. Here is the hardware for multiplication, which is ironically, I don't know ironically, but surprisingly significantly simpler because when we multiply exponents, right, we're just adding them. And so this is a significantly simpler process. So multiplying floating point numbers, I mean, it's still more complicated, but it's not the end of the world. You still have to multiply two numbers together, which we already saw was very complicated. And so in general, if you can avoid using floating point numbers, please do so uh, because the accuracy is not necessarily there. Uh, the complexity of comparisons is not there and the hardware itself is much more complicated. But at least now you know how it works uh, and so you can implement it if you need to.